Welcome to another episode of Onco Daily. Today, we are honored to have Dr. Viernik with us. Originally, he's from Costa Rica. Dr. Viernik is a distinguished figure in the field of cancer care with an impressive educational background from institutions like UC Med in Costa Rica, Karolinska Cancer Institute, University of Turin, Peter McCallum Cancer Center, and the University of Minnesota. He is known for his commitment to patient center care. Dr. Viernik has a profound expertise in cancer immunology and immunotherapy. And now, without further ado, let's jump in. All right. Uh, welcome, welcome. Thank you for being here today. Thank you so much. It's such a pleasure. I'm honored to be here. Thank you. Um, so I want to start by the first question, and I want to understand more about you. Why did you choose a career in medicine, and why specifically oncology among all the fields that are in medicine? Okay, so that's a long answer, but I'll try to be uh, to the point because I, I, I'm very passionate about what we do as oncologists. But um, so I grew up in Costa Rica, which is a very, very small country in Central America. You know, we're between, you know, Panama and Nicaragua. It's a country of about five million individuals. And there's a few things about Costa Rica that are peculiar. Number one, uh, we don't have an army. It's one of the only countries in the world without an army. Uh, and, and we have, a, you know, we, we're probably the strongest democracy in Latin America. And we Costa Ricans are very proud about those things. Uh, so I grew up in a very safe environment, you know, and I was blessed, you know, by, by growing up in Costa Rica, which is a beautiful country. But at the same time, you know, I grew up in a very, very small Jewish community of Costa Rica because my grandparents were Holocaust survivors. So despite the fact that I grew up in a very safe place, you know, I grew up hearing the stories of what, what my grandparents had to undergo when they were in the concentration camps, you know. So from a very young age, you know, I guess, you know, I had these seed in my mind that, you know, despite the fact that we were privileged to be born in a country like Costa Rica, that we needed to make an impact, you know. So mm -hmm. later on, you know, during my high school years, you know, you, you know, when you start thinking about, well, what do you want to do in your life? You know, um, I knew that I wanted to be in a profession uh, where I could have a lot of impact. And it was very obvious later on, you know, when you start thinking when you're an adolescent, you know, uh, young adult, you know, you start thinking, well, where is the impact? And it was very obvious that becoming a physician and pursuing a career in medicine was the right path. So that was really kind of what led me to that. And then the oncology part, you know, is not something that um, it became obvious from the very beginning. You know, um, I think I was also, I've always been blessed that um, unlike many of us, that sometimes some of us think, ah, oh, I, I don't know what I want to do. I, I've always been very, you know, uh, career oriented or goal oriented from a very young age. So I didn't know exactly what career I wanted to pursue later on or what specialty, but I knew that I wanted to be in a specialty again where I could have a lot of impact as a, as a person, you know, and as an individual. And, uh, uh, and also, you know, taking care of really sick people. I knew I wanted to deal with that, you know. Uh, and then, you know, there's always luck, you know. And in my case, you know, what happened, I started medical school here in Costa Rica. And we actually do our intern year, our part of our med school. So during that year, you know, I actually went to Children's Hospital here in Costa Rica and, you know, I was just selected to go to the oncology ward and I worked at the leukemia program at National Children's Hospital here in Costa Rica. So I needed to learn about pediatrics, but I learned it in hematology, you know, there at Children's. And, you know, my mentor at the time, the professor that I worked with, who is now a very close friend, uh, you know, when I finished, she said, oh, Andres, you're going to be uh, a medical oncologist. I have no doubt about that, you know, which I thought was uh, very kind of her. But at the time, I was already thinking about going to the United States. And I actually, at the time, was thinking that I was going to go to the U.S. Uh, to do cardiovascular surgery or transplant surgery. I felt that, you know, I, I again, I was looking for that opportunity to have a lot of impact. And at the time, I thought that that was the case. My second rotation was OBGYN. And since I was thinking about, you know, doing surgery, uh, I ask, well, what do you do more surgery in OBGYN? It's probably surgical oncology, you know, uh, sorry, gynecology oncology, you know, because they spend a lot of time in the OR and nobody wanted to take that rotation because you had to be in the hospital like at five o'clock in the morning. And since I wanted to be in the OR and I wanted to take care of patients, you know, 
I didn't mind and I had a great experience. I did that also here in Costa Rica. And then after that, you know, I went to a medical school uh, called USIMED that has an exchange program uh, with a hospital in Minnesota called Hennepin County Medical Center, which is now part of Hennepin Healthcare. And it's a university-based hospital. It's one of the hospitals that is part of the University of Minnesota. So I went there and I had to do internal medicine first for three months as part of my exchange program. And when I got there, they said, oh, these are the options you need to choose. And there was the option of doing um, medical oncology there. And at the time, you know, since I had done it in OBGYN and I had done it in pediatrics, I thought, well, I'll do that while I wait for my surgical rotation. Finally, I'll get to do the transplant part, but, uh, but at least, you know, I, I think I'll enjoy that. And I had, you know, an amazing experience. I worked with a a person who later became my mentor. There were two of them. One was uh, a physician who still works there. His name is Doug Rausch and uh, and also Mick Belzer, uh, who were medical oncologists there at the time. And Dr. Rausch, you know, later became not only my mentor, actually he became my my boss and who's the one who later on hired me to be part of the practice. And, and, and we're very close friends now. I, I adore him. Uh, but long story short, you know, it was a very eye-opening experience, you know, coming from a country that, you know, we're, we have a, a, a public system here in Costa Rica that has a universal healthcare system. So all my exposure to medicine prior to going to the U.S. was as part of the system, which is a very good system, but has a lot of limitations. And I really enjoyed the academic rigors that uh, internal medicine and hematologists and oncologists in the U.S. have. So that was at the time something that I thought, oh, I, I think I really like this. Later on, I actually went and did my surgical oncology rotation and I didn't like it. So I actually had to go back and 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 ask, you know, the me internal medicine group there, you know, if I could actually apply for residency there. Uh, so that's my short answer of how I got there. But obviously, I think that medical oncology as a field, you know, we're so blessed because we're meeting individuals in their most vulnerable time. So, so the impact we can have in those patients and those families is something that is so tangible uh, immediately. And you can do that multiple times a day, you know? So, so I think that there's no field that I, I identified that gives me that opportunity and that privilege. The other part is, you know, like many of us, I'm, I'm a big nerd and I like to study a lot, you know? So, so later on, you know, I pursue a career in academic medicine and research but but it was and, and even nowadays that I'm not longer doing, you know, translational research, uh, I'm doing clinical research, but, you know, the field, you know, makes you you have to read all the time. You know, yesterday I actually saw a patient and there was a paper, a paper just published in the New of Medicine that I can apply to that patient. You know, yeah. So we need to always study. And I like to study. I, I like reading and learning. Uh, so so this this field alone, you know, gives us that. So, so I always, when people ask me that question, I always say, well, the, the impact is right there. The second one is the academic, uh, the knowledge that, you know, you need to keep up with, you know, that's something that I love and I like to pursue. And the third is what I take home. And what I mean by that is, well, when I go home and I'm with my family, my wife, my kids, my parents, you know, my relatives, you know, uh, oncology keeps me in a very basic place. You know, it gives me perspective, you know, when you're dealing with people that unfortunately are suffering so much and some of them are unfortunately actively dying, then, you know, you, you take that home and you say, what's really important in your life and how do you want to pursue your life and what is what is that you want to do? So um, I'm always, you know, oncology brings me that to that core. So that's what I take home. And those are the values I try to you know, that I try to, you know, bring back and, and think about what are we doing and what, what impact that we have. So it's, it's a kind of a deep question, but deep answer, but I hope it's, it's the honest one, you know, that's for sure. No, it is actually the honest one. And it, it, it touched me in many points. I think uh, I do share with you lots of commonalities. My grandparents also like immigrated after the Armenian genocide. And uh, it's been a roller coaster for me from one country to another. And uh, having that feeling that you have impact on people's life, it's what gives you uh, the self of fulfillment, which is something it took me many, many years to figure out, right? Because uh, you can make money in any profession. It's not always about the money. Uh, you can make a mu even much higher income if you go and uh, work in investments, real estates, or other things. But I think that self of fulfillment 
So the, the feeling of fulfillment and whatever you are making is valuable. Um, I think that's very important to have on day-to-day -day basis because otherwise it's just going to be very, very tough and challenging and boring life. And I think you brought up a very important point and, and, and thank you for bringing that up. I, I, I still sometimes struggle with it and uh, because like you see patients in their most vulnerable points uh, of, of, of life and you see patients who remind you how blessed you are that you have your health and your family have their health and you go back home remembering the core values. Uh, cancer doesn't know an age. Uh, this week it's been roller coaster in the hospital. Like I've seen pa many patients in their 20s, 30s with cancers. And mm -hmm. that makes me a bit guarded thinking, oh, wow, I, like uh, I have my health. I'm very blessed. Yeah. And and, I, and again, I, I agree with you 100%. The other way I see these, you know, and, and thank you for sharing a bit about your background, uh, but I, 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 I was born in a privileged situation by just being in a very safe family environment, you know, and being in a country like ours. So I understand many times when people unfortunately come from backgrounds that are very challenging and that's really their drive. To me, it was a bit different. The drive was really since, since I didn't have to worry about so many things then it's my responsibility to make 110% of what I have. You know what I'm saying? So, so since I'm, since we are so privileged as physicians and oncologists in being in the position we have, you know, it's, it's not enough to give your 90%. We need to give 100% to our patients, you know? Uh, so that also is the reason why pursuing an academic career was important to me because I didn't have that in Costa Rica, but I said, well, if I'm going to do this, you know, I have to be, 110% good at it, you know, uh, otherwise it's not worth it, you know, um, and that's really what led me later on, you know, to pursue opportunities abroad, and and now, you know, I came back to Costa Rica to, to try to give back and and, and actually to, to have a, a broader uh, uh, impact, you know, different than we typically have, um, you know, when we're dealing with a one-to-one -one, uh, patient, you know, physician relationship. Dr. Bierling, you have a diverse educational background and you studied and trained in several countries. And I had even a hard time counting them from one country to another, from one part of, part of the world to another. Um, how this, first, I think my question is why? And then how it shaped, how this experience has shaped your approach to patient care? Yeah, so, so, so the first one, you know, uh... why, again, uh, because despite the fact that, you know, Costa Rica is a very good place to live, uh, I didn't have an opportunity to do any research, you know, to study immun deep immunology, you know, molecular biology, you know, that was not part of my curriculum. So, so it was very obvious to me that if I wanted to pursue a career in the United States, which was my original goal, I need to, you know, kind of raise that bar of, and, and pursue education in order to achieve my goal. Um, so, so I share a bit about that exchange program, uh, which was my first interaction with U.S. healthcare. Uh, but later on after when, you know, I, 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 since I went to medical school straight from high school, which is our, kind of what we do here, you know, I became a physician at a very young age. I think I was 22 or 23 years old, probably similar to you. And I was already an MD, you know, so, so I had a lot of time to say, well, maybe I'm not ready to pursue residency, but I want to be very competitive, you know, uh, and making sure that I'm the best doctor I can be. Um, so, so then I applied to a program which was also an opportunity in the United States. I went to uh, to Boston and spent a year at Dana-Farber as part of an exchange program. And it was through, um, you know, Brigham and Women's. And I spent some time at Beth Israel as well, you know, through the Harvard program. And, and, and then it was really, you know, living the academic world, you know, to the highest, you know, and I really enjoyed the, the people that I was working with. And I had a mentor there whose name is Wayne Marasco. I'm, I'm always very uh, good at, you know, making sure that those people get the credit because they were the ones that pushed me. And Dr. Marasco at the time when I finished my rotation, I would follow him everywhere, you know, first of all, he's sick of me, you know, cause I wanted to learn and I had a lot of energy, you know, and he said, Andrews, you know, you're a good student, you have good grades, but you need to spend time doing research if you want to be an oncologist, you know, et cetera. So, so later on what I did that weekend, I went home and I started applying for, you know, he actually offered me a position to be there, but I wanted, I didn't want it to burn my J1 
years and all these visa issues. So I thought, well, I'm 22, 23 years old. I can go anywhere, you know, and I asked him, where should I go if I'm not going to stay in the United States? And he said Sweden. So I went home that day and I actually went online uh, and I started sending emails, you know, to many places or many labs at the Karolinska Institute. And, um, and I think I sent like 60 emails, you know, describing who I was and that I was willing to, you know, uh, go uh, and spend time there. And I wanted to apply for fellowships or programs there. And I was so lucky and blessed, you know, that only two people answered of all the emails I sent. One said no. <laughs> and the other one, you know, said, well, tell me more. And what the hell are you thinking? And that was a gentleman by the name of Rolf Kisling, who happened to be at the time, I think, the director of the Karolinska Cancer Center. And Rolf had a lab there in tumor immunology, which I knew nothing about. Uh, but he was very generous and accepted me first as an observer. And later on, you know, I, I stayed there uh, for quite a bit of time, you know, learning about tumor immunology. And this is around 2006. So, you know, all these immunotherapy things that we do today in clinic, you know, were not really there at the time. You know, there were still the enriched cells. And I actually had a couple of projects, you know, where I was um, writing, you know, phase one and phase two protocols, you know, using the enriched cell vaccines at the time. But, uh, but you know, it really, again, opened the world to that opportunity. Uh, but I knew from the very beginning when I went there that I wanted to do residency. And before I went there to Sweden, I had already uh, been accepted to go to Minnesota for residency. So, so then I returned to the States, but I kept that relationship with Dr. Kiesling and his lab. And again, he was so generous that every time I had elective time, he would say, Andrews, would you come back to the lab because we need to finish some work? And then he also connected me with a program at the University of Turin that at the time was doing um, a project in DNA vaccines, uh, specifically for uh, 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 for animal models that express HER2. And this is around 2008, 2009. And then in 2010, I knew that I was going to stay in Minnesota, you know, for fellowship. And I really loved the tumor immunology world. Already I had learned experience and I had already some um, you know, I, I really enjoy the translational research world. So that year, my third year of residency, I had time, uh, elective time. So so I emailed, um, uh, I wanted to learn about T-cell engineering, which at the time, you know, car T-cells were not around. Uh, so I had the privilege uh, to work with a gentleman called Michael Kershaw, who is a PI uh, at Peter Mac in Australia. And Dr. Kershaw actually had, he did a fellowship and a postdoc at the NCI with Steve Rosenberg and actually moved back to Australia to develop his CAR T-cell program there. So I went to Australia and spent time with him, working with him, um, you know, for a very short time. But it, it was it was really, for me, great because I learned, you know, a bit about, you know, CAR T-cells before they were actually uh, in clinical practice. And then when I returned to Minnesota for fellowship, I worked very closely with uh, Jeff Miller, who happened to who happens to be, you know, one of the, you know, most recognized uh, individuals and PIs in the world of NK cell cellular therapies. So, so I was in, in, in Dr. Miller's lab for a few years during fellowship. And, and that's really what led me to these international places and, and my training. And again, it was because people opened doors for me at the time. Wow, it's very interesting. It, it never occurs to me that for me, like uh, when I always think about, okay, so how you can get a residency in the U.S., it's like always going to the big names. But in your case, you were referred to go to Sweden. I was referred to go to Sweden uh, because obviously, well, Sweden is, is, is has a, a, a great reputation. You know, they have a, an, out, an outstanding uh, uh, academic program. You know, the Karolinska Institute has a, has a great name and a great reputation, especially in the field of tumor immunology. And I think Dr. Marasco, you know, he's also an immunologist, so so he knew about the, the place, but I specifically told him that I was open to go abroad. And mm -hmm. so that's probably part, you know, he said, well, if you're going to go abroad, I would recommend that you go to Sweden. So that's how I ended up there. Gotcha, gotcha. Um, so throughout your career, you also received, like, you, you received uh, several teaching awards. So you're combining a clinician, a researcher, and a teacher. Um, I want to understand a bit more about your philosophy when it comes to educating the next generation of uh, physicians and oncologists. Yeah, I mean, um, 
again, you know, um, some people identify a field and they say, I want to be a researcher or I want to be a clinical physician. And some people like the education component. I was, again, blessed. And, and I had the problem as well that I like everything, you know, so you also <laughs> it's always, you know, trade-offs there. But um, but again, when I was in residency and later on in fellowship and, and eventually in clinical practice in Minnesota, you know, I really, I always worked in an academic center, you know, and, and with residents and fellows. And and I obviously love to teach. And um, I'm a strong believer that if you're a good teacher, that means you understand the physiology behind things, you know, if you can explain things, you know, you, you're, you're good at it. Um, and, and I was um, probably a good communicator. I think that also helps us in oncology, you know, so, um, so I, you know, I like talking to people and relating to individuals. So, so you know, I was just blessed that I, you know, I, I always put a lot of energy. It's not that it's supernatural. You know, I always prepare myself when I'm giving a talk or when I'm teaching someone, but I really enjoy that. I think that, you know, again, part of it is because I like it. Part of it is because I had terrific mentors. You know, I wouldn't be in the position where I am without them. So it's always this, you know, I need to give back as well. Um, now in Costa Rica, where I am, and I assume we'll talk about this in a bit, you know, we have the responsibility of of, of what the next generation of oncology is going to do and, and what resources they have and how we can pursue that, specifically in countries like mine, you know, where there might be a gap in knowledge sometimes between what physicians are learning here versus in the U.S. or other countries, you know. So, so I think that that's where the opportunity is. But I, I now I see it almost a, as part of our responsibility as as providers, you know. Yeah. Yeah, I can't agree more. I think the best ways of learning is teaching. Mm -hmm. um, one of the things that I get, uh, uh, I was exposed to is uh, during my fellowship right now uh, in hematology oncology is like we have to present like X amount of uh, uh, journal clubs as well as like uh, specific teachings in hematology and oncology. And I believe the month that I have that, although preparing for a journal club or a presentation that lasts for an hour, it takes a full month with the clinical practice, especially like it's a, in, in oncology, like you always go to the trials and what, what the trial showed and the overall survival and progression free survival. So, so there's lots of academic um, exercise there, but preparing that PowerPoint slides for some reason, and it's much more efficient or much more powerful for me to learn a topic than opening an article from up to date or ASCO guidelines or, or ASH guidelines and reading it. Just preparing yeah. the slides by itself, it's a huge learning exercise. I, I fully agree. I still have those uh, PowerPoint <laughs> presentations myself and what I've been doing you know, years later. You know, I graduated from fellowship 2013, so almost 11 years ago, it's going to be. Oh, wow. And I still have those presentations, you know, that I did during fellowship. And what I do is actually, as new da data comes up, you know, I just add a slide, you know, and I continue the story, you know. Uh, so so I'm, I fully agree. I think that, you know, we we need that. And um, and now, uh, you know, even, even when I was a fellow, I mean, uh, access to knowledge, you know, is right there. Uh, and we need just to keep up with it, you know, but, uh, but I think, you know, uh, societies like ASCO and, and ASH, you know, and, and probably others, you know, are, are, are really, you know, pushing, you know, for, for this and trying to make knowledge more accessible, you know, obviously the COVID had a lot of challenges for many of us, but among the positive things, it's, you know, see the, the oncology mentality, always seeing the glass half full, you know, is the fact that, you know, that knowledge is becoming more available, more easy, you know, more accessible, therefore, it's there. It's just a matter whether or not you're studying. You know, exactly, exactly. Um, I was also going through uh, your bio, and I noticed that you pursued an MBA from the University of Chicago. So all this learning, all the universities all over the world, was not enough for you. You still wanted to pursue an MBA. Um, well, why and how it's helping you in your current leadership role? Sure. So, so to continue a bit of my life story, I guess, you know, when I graduated in 2013, I really had to make a decision of what I wanted to pursue, you know, uh, should I stay in an academic uh, place, a university hospital, or go to the community, you know, I also had this handicap, and I call it like that, you know, I was on a J-1 visa, so I need to, I needed to do a waiver, um, and, and, and also the, the reality is that I, I felt at the time, 
that despite the fact that I had spent a lot of years, you know, in, in the lab, you know, that I didn't have the drive to be, to become a PI, you know, in a lab and doing all the work that they do, which I find terrific, but I just, I just knew that in order to do that, I had to leave the clinic. That's at least how I felt. I know some people are good in doing both, but again, I'm typically very driven and I felt that I needed to make a decision. Uh, so at the time I decided not to stay in academics and instead, you know, I, I was um, hired, you know, to do my uh, my first job as a medical oncologist, you know, at Hennepin County Medical Center, which is Hennepin Healthcare today, which again is affiliated to the University of Minnesota, but is the county, you know, is the county hospital of the Twin Cities, especially in Minneapolis, and it's a safety net place. And and it was that's where I did my, I was there as a medical student. I did my residency there. I actually was a fellow there. Uh, that's where I met my wife. You know, so so it was very obvious to me that I should stay there. And again, this is where I had a lot of my mentors and people that really love the practice of medicine. So so I, I thought it was the perfect match. And to be very honest, I never thought I would be leaving the place. Um, but after a few years in practice, uh, uh, you know, we, which was terrific, you know, there we, we took care of a lot of patients, very diverse, you know, I was at the time, I think only, I think in the entire state of Minnesota, there was only two or three oncologists that spoke Spanish. So I had, a, I had to take care of a very large Hispanic community there. And we created a Hispanic program. It was a really wonderful place to practice. I, if anyone wants to be hired at Hennepin, you should go to Hennepin. But, uh, <laughs> uh, but, but at the same time, you know, um, around 2015, 2016, uh, you know, I felt that I had already, uh, I felt, you know, very comfortable, you know, as a clinician and as a medical oncologist. So I needed, I started to get that each. I needed to do more. And a few opportunities, um, uh, became available, you know, actually at the system, you know, to, you know, I was part of the medical executive committee and I really started, started thinking, well, if I'm not going to be able to stay in academics, you know, I, I'm very comfortable with clinical practice, but I felt that I needed more. And I felt that maybe, you know, pursuing a career as an executive physician eventually could help me be in a position, uh, you know, where I could not necessarily have that impact one-on-one, -on -one, but have a larger, a broader uh, uh, impact, you know, and capacity to, to, to have that impact. Um, so I started, you know, pursuing that, you know, in Minnesota and around that time, you know, I was approached by a group, which is where I work now, uh, here in Costa Rica, which is a healthcare system that at the time was interested in developing, uh, a cancer program, uh, here in Costa Rica. And, you know, I started, uh, you know, having discussions here. And then, you know, they offered me to be part of their board just as an advisor, you know, because they didn't know how to develop a, a cancer center. And, and I actually was trying to help them develop a cancer service line because I, I understood the system much better. Um, so long story short, you know, after a couple of almost a year doing this, you know, you know, the program started growing here in Costa Rica and the opportunity came where I need to, needed to make a decision either I would return to Costa Rica and work with this group or just say, well, this is becoming huge. I cannot manage it from Minnesota. You know, I need to step away and let them pursue it on their own. Um, my wife is also from Costa Rica. And at the time we already had a child. Uh, Sam was born in 2015. So around 2016, 2017, we had to make the decision, well, we're going to go back or we're going to stay in the States. But I knew that if I made the decision of coming back to Costa Rica, I was going to need a lot more administrative skills, which we as clinicians typically do not have. So I actually negotiated, you know, that, all right, I'll quit my job in Minnesota. I'll move back to Costa Rica with my family to help develop the system and develop the program. But uh, I felt that, you know, going through an MBA program was going to give me the skills required in order to understand, you know, the, uh, you know, a lot of the operations, the administrative, the finance, you know, behind running a, a system or a hospital. So, so that's what I did, you know, and, and, you know, I actually did it with my wife. So my wife and I went to the University of Chicago, the Booth School of Business. We did the executive MBA, and that's usually about two years from 2017 until 2019. So we traveled back and forth, you know, for 22 months, you know, while my son was here in Costa Rica with grandparents. And, oh, and wow. then at the time we were working, you know, also here to try to develop the program and the system uh and and yeah so 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 that's really what led us to that but again to me going back to the beginning you know it's always been about 
the impact. And I think that doing the MBA, especially now in the position where I am, uh, I'm currently the CEO of the hospital. Um, obviously, I can I understand you know the system much better. And obviously, being a physician, I still practice oncology. I see patients almost every day. You know, so, you know, not as much as I would like to, but you know, I have limited time. But you know, I just um, before the interview started, I told you know, I think I'm in the perfect world. You know, because I can really do what I, what I feel is best for me, which is being in the clinic and being in a position where I, I can, you know, impact the society where we live. Yeah, I can't agree more with that. Especially, like, I, I think three things that we don't learn enough about when we are in medical school uh, or even residency, they are finance, um, nutrition, and entrepreneurship. Uh, mm -hmm. We learn how to become a good clinicians, and then you grab some skills doing research by observing other people. But to run a hospital to run a clinic or to bring a product to life and make a difference in healthcare, you have to learn how to become a good operator. And this is a skill that we lack in medical schools. And that's what I'm passionate about. I always say like, uh, for us, if as physicians, if we don't step up, there will be someone with an MBA background who doesn't understand healthcare will be in your position today and run that system. And there is nothing wrong with people who don't have clinical background with an MBA. I don't have anything against that, but like, you should have the clinical expertise and contact with patients to understand the difference or to balance between profit and good quality of care. Mm -hmm. I fully agree. I think that also when you're in a leadership position, you know, um, again, there's different leadership styles and I'm always, you know, with my, the team that I work very closely with, which are extremely talented, you know, despite the fact that I did an MBA, I'm, I'm not, you know, an economist, I'm not an engineer, you know, so so you just have to also think what are the areas where you feel less strong and bring people that can help you with those, you know, so so we have, you know, again, we're in a position where we have a lot of people that have, that bring different value, you know, to our leadership, you know, uh, so despite the fact that I'm not a finance, you know, uh, genius, you know, we have somebody who's extremely good at that. So, so, so I think that at the end of the day, you know, um, uh, at least in our institution here, you know, it's about, you know, creating a team of leaders that understand the mission of what we're trying to do and that we push forward to try to achieve it, you know. You touched base a bit on your leadership style. Can you tell me like um, take home points, snippets on leading teams um, as a person with clinical expertise and an MBA degree? What, what are the take home points if you're going to summarize it in a couple of minutes? Sure, I'll try to say maybe two things right away. One is, you know, be humble. You know, again, <laughs> very young. You know, uh, I'm 42 years old, and you know, uh, and there's people again in our team that have a lot more experience than I do uh, in 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 our institution. You know, so so you know, if, if you think you know everything, you know, you're so wrong. You know, so that's the first one. Um, the other one is again, you know, learning to work as a team. You know, and I, I strongly value that. You know. Um, I think that that's really important and understanding, you know, the strategy as, as we continue to grow. And what we do here is we basically, our mission is to provide affordable healthcare access to Costa Ricans, you know, uh, because our, our country, unfortunately, you know, through the public system doesn't have enough capacity to take care of everyone, you know, right now. So we're trying to, you know, develop, you know, access to care through many different um, initiatives, but but you also have to have that drive, you know, and I think that's, you have to be passionate. That's the other thing, you know, you need to love what you're doing every single day. You touched base also on the healthcare system in Costa Rica. I, I would really appreciate if I can understand more about it. Could you provide me with an like 30,000 feet overview of the healthcare system and how it's structured and how it's funded? Yeah, very straightforward. You know, we're blessed to have a, a what's called a universal healthcare system here. You know, all of us pay for it, you know, and, and therefore we all have the right to have access to care. Um, it was based a bit on some of the Scandinavian systems, you know, with the big difference, you know, that uh, unfortunately we don't have the budget, you know, uh, in order to <laughs> pay for all the, you know, cost of healthcare here, especially in the last, you know, several decades, you know, there's been uh, unfortunately a lot of struggle, you know, for uh, many uh, individuals to access the system. There, there's unfortunately a lot of waiting lists, you know, 
uh, to have access to, let's say, even basic things like mammograms or follow-up scans, you know, et cetera. You know, a colonoscopy is actually sometimes over a year before people can have access to care um, if it's not an emerging situation, you know. So, um, so, so we belong to the private sector, you know, but there, but again, you know, despite the fact that we're a private company, we have a very strong social mission. So the, from the very beginning, you know, we've, uh, you know, the, the mission has been, well, what infrastructure can we develop, you know, to develop initially was a, a hospital, then it became a network of clinics. And now our system provides care in over 125 sites in Costa Rica, because we have different things in the system. We're, you know, we're, we're we have our own health plan. We have, you know, labs. We have pharmacies, etc. So, so the system, you know, is again trying to provide access to care. And every day, our mission is: can how can we lower the bar and make it more accessible so more people can actually come to the system if they need to? So, so that's really how we work, and that's how we interject with the with the government, which obviously does a a, a great job. Uh, you know, the the quality of care in Costa Rica. Uh, in the public system is actually very high, which is a good thing. That's a blessing we have, you know. So again, you always have to, uh, there's two ways of looking at it. Oh, you know, there's a lot of problems. We just see there's a lot of opportunity. Costa Rica is small. People are highly educated. You know, the distances, you know, people don't need to travel hours to receive care. So so we need to find ways to try to, you know, help, you know, um, the, the country, you know, to provide care. So 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 that's really, you know, that's really how we operate here. So are both sectors available, like private sector and public sector? Yeah, they're both available. You know, right now they, there's no, there are countries where people can jump from one to the other. Uh, we don't have such a formal uh, relationship. You know, uh, the government doesn't have uh, uh, programs that, you know, patients can jump from one system to the other. But I'll just give you a very brief example. In 2018, we started the breast cancer program. Uh, I think that our group right now probably we diagnose close to twenty percent of all breast cancer diagnoses in the country happen in our system. Oh, wow! That doesn't mean that all those women receive the entire care with us, but because they were able to access, let's say, mammogram and ultrasound and get a biopsy if needed, and we provide you know all of that within a week and give them the results with an IHC, then those patients can say, well you know, now I have a diagnosis, so we can shorten, you know, that diagnostic interval. And, and those patients now can go back to the public system and, and receive care, let's say, in oncology. Uh, but, but if they had to do all of that diagnostic part, you know, through the system, you know, it might take them months, if not longer, you know. So, so again, you know, the mission has always been, where is the need? And let's, what are initiatives that we can develop to to help in, in where, where where the system is lacking. Thankfully, uh, the system is not lacking in providing chemotherapy uh, or treatment directly. But on the other side of the spectrum is also survivorship care. You know, those patients, you know, I recently saw a patient that, you know, she had a, a scan done, I want to say in April. I saw her about two weeks ago, we're in November, you know, and she had a scan done in April and, and it has not been reported. She had it done in the- Oh, wow. Public. You know, so 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 those are the problems we have. You know, so so our system, our model, has been, um, and I say this very proudly, uh, a great opportunity to uh, to kind of you know close those gaps where we can. You know, so 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 yeah. Gotcha. So the private system is helping as a guidance for the public system to detect those people who need more emergent care. If I'm saying it correctly, you could say it that way. I mean, I, I also think that way, but it's not that we're helping. It's just that unfortunately, patients don't have an option, you know. And the question is, can they afford it? You know, because private care is also expensive. So we've been for many years, you know, uh, you know, our health plan is is very uh, uh, accessible. You know, it's, it's about twelve dollars a month. You know, for the principal person and then each individual family member pays six dollars a month so so when we're talking about a hair plan you know is not hundreds of, or thousands of dollars you know uh to be part of a plan therefore those type of initiatives you know have helped you know especially people in you know middle income families of costa rica you know that before they said well 
I need to receive care, but I cannot afford the private sector. So that's where we have been able to fulfill um, a need, you know. Uh, but despite what we've been doing over the last, you know, 10 years, the reality is that there's still people in Costa Rica that cannot even afford, you know, coming to our system. So we're now working really hard. How can we develop some system even for those that, you know, have very low income, you know, because they also obviously need care, you know. Yeah. Gotcha. So something similar to Medicare and Medicaid in the U.S., but the Costa Rica version. I guess so. But again, without federal funding, we don't have any funding. Yeah, federal. fair enough. In, in your opinion, uh, how does the quality of cancer care in Costa Rica is different or compared to other countries that you've been through? Mm -hmm. I think, and I say this proudly, despite the fact that I did not train here, so I'm not, I, I hope I'm not as biased. Uh, but when I returned to Costa Rica, one of the things that I uh, encountered, which is a very positive thing, is that oncologists are very well trained. So physicians, you know, they, they pursue excellent training through the public system. You know, they're, you know, they're, they're very, um, you know, also academic driven, you know, like many other places, you know, they always attend, you know, the big meetings, they're always, you know, learning more. So I, I think the doctors and the human capital is there. I think obviously the challenge is not, not necessarily, in our case, you know, it's not necessarily, again, that there's, that the providers don't have the knowledge or the training is actually accessing the treatments, you know, and the cost of care, specifically cancer drugs, you know, which are so expensive. So, so many doctors have experience, let's say, or they, they know about a lot of the molecular drugs or the immunotherapy drugs, but some of them have never used them because the public system might not offer them, you know? So, but so, so that's really the challenge. So it's, that's really the reality of, of how Costa Rica operates. So the biggest challenge that faces oncologists is giving patients access to the appropriate treatment, if I'm saying it yes. correctly. Yeah, and I think that's true, obviously, in the public system, but also in the private sector, because, you know, when I meet patients, you know, um, you have to be very careful, you know, because obviously we follow NCCN guidelines here as an example, or ASCO or ESMO guidelines, you know, but whatever it says on the guideline, I might not be able to offer to my patient because they might not afford it. You know, I know there's resource stratified guidelines, but again, those guidelines have limitations in countries like us because we might have access to a few things, not others, you know? So, so, but to me, and again, we need to personalize care at the end of the day. And there might be patients that might have private insurance and they could afford, you know, care. But when I have to take care of patients that do not have private insurance, you know, uh, you know, I also have to be very respectful and not offering them treatments that unfortunately they won't be able to, to, to get, you know, through us or through the public system. So, so that's where you need to, you know, find the right balance and be very careful and very ethical about, you know, you know, what, how, which, which is the way you can, I always tell my patients, I'm not here to treat you, I'm here to help you. And by, what I mean by that is we're going to try to figure these out. I don't know how, um, I'll give you examples for this. Uh, breast cancer, I, you know, that's been the area where I've been focusing the most uh, clinically. And many times, you know, we talk about neoadjuvant therapy, you know, and all these things. Mm -hmm, uh, mm -hmm. in the field. But here the decision is sometimes, well, yes, I would like to give her neoadjuvant, but what if, you know, the system is not going to be able to get her the right drugs, you know, um, and, 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 and actually in order to get, let's say, neoadjuvant treatment, she might have to wait, I don't know how many months, you know, so as an example for, let's say, luminal A localized uh, or locally advanced breast cancer, where sometimes you would like to probably shrink the tumor so patients can undergo breast conservative surgery, some things we cannot offer that here. And we have to elect, you know, pursuing surgery up front because at least we know those patients can have, a, a, you know, a surgery, you know, otherwise, you know, th they might actually develop metastatic disease if we just keep waiting for the neoadjuvant therapy. Uh, so, so those are the type of decisions we have to face here sometimes that are challenging, and I'm sure they're not only exclusive to our reality. For many, no, countries. they are not. No, they are not. I completely agree with you. I think um, it's it's similar to other countries we were talking about um, earlier about my interview with Dr. Vaisaki, and mm -hmm. it's it's very similar there. And I also trained in Canada. In Canada, it's completely uh, public system, so there is no private healthcare sector, unless in some parts of the Quebec 
um, part of the uh, so the, the Quebecois part, the, the French part of the country. Um, but it's interesting because like in Canada, we do have, I think it's also different economics of the uh, country. We do have access to most, of, not all, most of the treatments, as you said. And it's, it, it's a question that always comes to me. I experienced a fully private healthcare system in Canada and I'm experiencing around the, sorry, but the fully public. And I'm experiencing the extreme end now in the US where it's mainly um, private and you experience also a mix of both. Do you, how do you envision, there is no perfect healthcare system, but I would love to hear your opinion. Like if you wanna restructure the healthcare system in a perfect world, how do you envision is the best way of funding healthcare? I'm going to be very honest. I, I find a very hard time answering that because you need to understand a lot of the realities of the different countries we're talking about. I don't think that a model that works in Costa Rica might be something that you can extrapolate, you know, easily to other countries if they have different, you know, socioeconomic, cultural, political uh, characteristics, you know. So, um, obviously there are, and I'm not an expert in this, obviously there's people that study and do this for life, you know, uh, but since I've been able to practice in the U S as an example, I'll actually give you the other side of the coin. You know, we all recognize that we, we don't even think about cost in the U S you know, when I practice there, nobody's asking me, well, doctor, what is the cost of my treatment? Very, very, few right. and we don't, as physicians, we don't even think about it. Um, in this part of the world, when I meet with patients, you know, one of the first questions that comes to the table from the physician, sorry, from the patients and their families is not about what's my stage, what's my prognosis, is what's going to cost me to receive care. So people are extremely uh, sensi sensitive to this uh, appropriately because they need to make decisions. And, uh, and, and that's obviously, you know, it's great to be in a, in a position where you don't have to think about that, but somebody's paying for it in the US or somewhere else, trust me, you know, we all know that. <laughs> um, and so I think that there's always, you know, two sides of the coin. Um, again, uh, talking about Costa Rica, which is obviously the country where I practice and where I have more knowledge, I think that uh, Costa Rica system is good, you know, because we have that safety net, you know, so again, you know, that that's great. And again, the quality of care in the public system is terrific. Uh, I think the country is just struggling to, you know, as healthcare cost is rising, you know, and we have a limited budget, you know, appropriately the government has to make decisions and how can we provide care? And sometimes they have to decide, well, if I'm going to accept, you know, uh, a therapy, you know, that costs hundreds of thousands of dollars, you know, after several months, you know, what, what the government could do with that money is probably treat, you know, or open clinics or, you know, you know, open capacity for other medical uh, conditions. So, so it's very, you know, it's very challenging, you know, from an ethics perspective as well. Uh, so, so, so I feel it would be disrespectful for me to tell you, you know, my, you know, I don't have an answer, but even if I did, you know, uh, because I think that each country is different, you know, uh, we, we provide care through actually here to a lot of patients from Central America. You know, we have patients that cross the border to receive care here in Costa Rica. Uh, oh, wow. And we actually have a, a program with Nicaragua where few patients can actually receive radiation there. So they come to Costa Rica and they get chemo radiation for cervical cancer, head and neck cancer, and then they go back. You know, one, one aspect that I think is, I, I want to bring this up, you know. Yeah. Um, this is something actually we're writing a couple of papers, you know, through ASCO and, and JCO and, uh, and the Journal of Global Oncology that are going to be coming up. But is how can we use research to, you know, as a, as a venue to provide care? So we started a, a, a research institute. It's called the Metropolitano Research Institute. We're an mm -hmm. SMO as a management organization. We started this in 2020 <laughs> during COVID, great year. Um, <laughs> and it was a year, you know, to get it started, you know, and now we have, you know, uh, the staff is, is terrific. We have about, you know, 12 people working full dedicated to research, clinical coordinators and all of that. And we trained almost 50, 60 of our staff, you know, in, 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 in all the, you know, best practices, et cetera. And now we have over 20 clinical uh, studies that, you know, we can offer to the Costa Rican population uh, so they can receive care through clinical research, you know. Um, and I think that's a model that obviously is difficult to scale uh, because we depend on, you know, what type of uh, studies come to countries like ours. 
but the impact we're having through a clinical research program is outstanding because we can really bring patients that there's absolutely no way they could receive the care they're receiving unless they were part of a clinical trial. Uh, and I'm not even talking about those that are getting treatment through the treatment arm. I'm even talking about the placebo arm because those patients, otherwise, they might not get access to care at all. Uh, and I, I could spend hours telling you about, you know, how many patients we've screened for a clinical trial that at the end were not be able, were not able to enroll. They failed screening, but because of part of that screening, they got their biopsy and their staging. And now <laughs> they can go to the public system and get care, you know. You, you, oh, you, wow. So, so, so I think that we need to, uh, you know, and those are the things I think we need to focus on. You know, I can't change the Costa Rican law or policies, you know, which obviously we all need to get involved, but um, but you'll, but in my world, you know, those are the type of things that we can truly do to bring value uh, and to and to bring access to care. Uh, and I think that that's something that can be replicated, you know, and, and especially we as oncologists, you know, through our associations, we can have, um, we can create policies in order to bring more research to this part of the world, you know. That's very interesting. You can pursue a research at the same time you can provide care for patients in need. Um, yep. That's very interesting insight that I never thought about because like I've never been in that part of the world, but like uh, it's a great way of looking at it. Also you're advancing science at the same time. Like it's win-win situation for everyone. Indeed, you know, so again, uh, I think that the biggest, and I'll be very honest. I mean, the, the biggest challenge we have to grow the program now is convincing sponsors to come to Costa Rica or countries like ours to do research and we have the quality, we have the, you know, we have the, the SOPs, you know, and, and not mm -hmm, only us, mm -hmm. other people doing that here in Costa Rica and in the region, you know, so so we need, you know, people to, to look into, you know, this as an opportunity, you know, and convince them, you know, it takes time, you know, I'm not very patient as you can see sometimes. <laughs> <laughs> Momentum, you know. But, uh, but but there know, is lots of energy. Vision. I can see that for sure. <laughs> I can see lots of energy, a lot of passion. I love it. <laughs> All right. I don't want to take more of your time. It's almost five o'clock. My last question. So what advice do you have for early career oncologists? Oh, God. Um, <laughs> I think that, uh, again, uh, you just have to pursue what makes you happy. And, and and that sounds very simple and excuse me if I say the word dumb, you know, but but you need to sometimes step back and say what I'm trying to. And I, and I struggle with this during my training and even nowadays, you know, I'll be honest, you know, you know, sometimes, I, you know, in all these rush, you know, we see hundreds of patients or problems all over, you know, this is the reality of a healthcare institution, you know, and sometimes you need to step back and say, what's making me happy, what's important to me, and what do I see myself, you know, in the next five years, 10 years, etc. And then once you, it's always not, it's, I guarantee it's never going to work the, it's never going to end the, the, the way you thought. But as long as you can start thinking about what is my next step. Uh, and, and I think my story is an example of that. You, you If you pursue that with your heart, then the doors will open. It might not be the doors you were thinking, but the doors will open. And as long as you're very passionate and you work extremely hard for that, um, you you will get somewhere. It might not be where you wanted to get specifically, but in hindsight, you know, I think that having that open mentality and focus on what's important is at the end what matters, independently of if it's in this hospital, in that institution, et cetera. Uh, and, and the reality is that you can always change, you know, uh, as... <laughs> I mean, this is not a contract, you know, we're just making decisions as we go. So I think that my my personal experience, you know, I, I, I've i learned from that, you know, uh, and I always, you know, after a few years where I'm in a position, I say, well, am I fully content here or are there certain things that I still want to pursue? And, you know, we always keep learning. Sweet. Thank you. Such a pleasure. Thank you so much. I appreciate that. I really appreciate your time. And it's been a pleasure. I learned a lot. And I'm sure everyone who's listening to this also will learn a lot today. Thank you. Such a privilege and an honor to be part of this. Thank you for inviting me.